So turn with me if you will. We're going to be reading here this morning is our text from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to begin there in verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 16. Again I say, let no one think me foolish. But if you do, receive me even as foolish, so that I also may boast a little. What I am saying, I am not saying as the Lord would, but as in foolishness, in this confidence of boasting, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. For you being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly. For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. To my shame, I must say, that we have been weak by comparison. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. <laughs> I'm more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received the, Jew, the Jews' 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in danger Dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying in Damascus, the ethnarch under Eratos, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. Well, what a privilege it is as God's people to come together under God's Word. This morning, as we turn to the last half of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we find the Apostle Paul going head-to-head -head with those false apostles who have infiltrated the church at Corinth, having boasted of their superiority, their polished communication skills, their prosperity-laced gospel, and their impeccable credentials that they have brought letters and references. And Paul has exposed these men for who and what they really are. For such men, he says, are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. And as he warned Timothy, 
Men like these, they are lovers of self and lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they hold to a form of godliness. They look godly. They look and sound like there's something right about them, but there's everything wrong with them because they have denied its power. That is godliness, the form of godliness and and following after God. And so he emphatically calls Timothy and each one of us here this morning to avoid such men as these. The Corinthian believers have been taken in by the foolish boastfulness of these false apostles. And so as Paul continues his defense of his own apostleship, he takes a surprising turn and he begins to boast and and just note he boasts foolishly. And I put that in quotes because it is a a mocking response, a sarcastic response, as it were. But in the midst of the way that he is mimicking these false prophets in terms of their boasting, their foolish boastfulness, uh, Paul is revealing truth. And ultimately, um, as he speaks Uh, foolishly, boast foolishly of his pedigree, uh, of his ministry accomplishments. He also represents the definitive, uh, definitive, authenticating mark of his own calling as as a true apostle of Jesus Christ. And and Paul makes this statement there in 2 Corinthians verse uh, uh, 11, verse 30, when he declares, I will boast in what pertains to my weakness. Now, as we look at Paul, I I don't want you to think of Paul as just just utter and complete weakness uh, in terms of his life and and, in his ministry. Um, you know, he, he, he recognizes his weakness in terms of, of his need and dependence fully upon God. The world would look at this. They would look at him arguing um, the case for all the, the terrible things that have happened in his life. And, and, you know, these foolish, false apostles, they would look at that and they would argue, well, here's proof positive that this guy is not worth listening to. But when we read these, when we read this account, when we read this delineated statement with regard to all that he suffered, it rings a bell that goes all the way back to his calling when God, the Lord, said to Ananias uh, as he was telling him not to worry about going to to the house of Judas on Straight, Straight Street to lay hands on this man who he knew was coming to destroy the church and arrest more people, and persecute the church, he says, he's my chosen servant. And I'm sending him to rulers and kings. I'm sending him to Gentiles and Jews. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And that's what we see here. The the world would look at, at this type of credential and say, I want nothing to do with that. They want the health and wealth and prosperity that the false apostles are propagating. But the reality, brothers and sisters, even though our lives are not void of the joys and the provisions of God in our life, we are told time and time again throughout the Scriptures that we will live in this world and experience tribulation and suffering and sickness, and contrary to those who would propagate um, a mindset that you can have your best life now, the reality is the life that we are experiencing right now, right now will, will just pale in comparison to what's coming to those who belong to Christ, that those who love His appearing. And so Paul is boasting, and I I know that as, as we, we begin to, to share these truths, when he says uh, there 
Now that, um, hey, I don't want you to think of me as foolish. But if you do, receive me as foolish. Because I'm going to boast a little. And he's almost eating those words as he's saying it because that is so distasteful for him as an apostle that, that he would only, if he is going to boast, and he tells us if we're going to boast in anything, let us boast in Christ and His death and His resurrection. And so we find here in our text this morning, first this introduction to his boasting when, when he says here that, you know, uh, and I, 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 I lay it out this way, uh, just, just to kind of mark the, the steps that we're going to take through the text, but Paul will boast foolishly according to the flesh. Because that's what these guys have done. So you, you want to see me boast some? I can boast with the best of them. But he's, he's not boasting about that. He's cringing in doing this. And matter of fact, he, he even speaks of that reality when, when he, he says, uh, I'm like a madman as he begins to do this. And he even clarifies that this is not what the Lord would do, but um, he is going to move forward in terms of this foolish boasting. But then Paul will boast foolishly in his strengths. And we know, we know from other texts in the Scripture that that Paul has already gotten over those strengths, that he sees them for what they are, that his Hebraic pedigree, as it were, um, would mean nothing for him in terms of salvation and reconciliation with God. And he makes that very clear. And again, you know, these writings were going around from church to church. So, for instance, as we will look at what Paul says about his Hebraic pedigree uh, and those credentials in Philippians chapter 3, most likely the Corinthians would get that letter and they would hear that. They would read that. They would know about these things. And Paul is is making uh, the case that, you know, they're over and over again in the book of Romans and in Galatians, you know, where everybody is hanging on to, uh, you know, their Hebraic traditions and um, the old covenant um, principles and laws that uh, he said there's no salvation uh, in them. What the law reveals um, is death because that's what the penalty for sin is. Every time you see a law in the Old Testament, you, you see the law, what God demands, and then you see the pen- penalty, um, which ultimately is death. <laughs> it's death. And that's the wages of sin, Paul would tell us in, in the book of Romans, that the wages of sin is death. And he would also clarify that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So first, Paul will boast foolishly according to the flesh. He's going to just do like these foolish false apostles uh, because the Corinthians had just, just ate it hook, line, and sinker. And then Paul will boast foolishly in his strengths. And then finally, Paul will boast foolishly in his weakness. And there, there cannot be a better... Um, delineation in the scriptures of Paul's ministry that identifies and authenticates his true apostleship that is unfolding in these verses. So Paul will boast foolishly according to flesh. And he does so since the Corinthians have readily received such foolish and fleshly boasting from these false apostles. And he argues there, again, this is not the first time he has said this, but he says, uh, he argues that no one think to, of him as foolish. But if they receive him as foolish, then he will boast a little. He is not saying, as the Lord would say. As the Lord, he, he's not taking one out of the playbook of, of the Lord Himself. And, and He doesn't mean by this that this portion of the Scripture is not from the Lord. Some people have thought that. Well, He said, I, I'm not saying what the Lord would say, so the, the following statements do not apply to the Scriptures. No, that's not what He's saying. He, he has said this before in, in 
Uh, as, he's, as he's talking about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he's talking about you know, marriage and, and divorce and these kinds of things. And, and then he's, he says what the Lord has revealed already and spoken, but then I say, and in other words, this is a new revelation that is, is God-given. It's, it's Scripture, though. This is Scripture. And so he's not saying as the Lord would say, but as in foolishness. And he says there in verse 18, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. And Paul clarifies that the Corinthians being wise, and that word, uh, another way that, that we can think of that word in, as translated is prudent. That you're so prudent, you're so discerning, you're so wise that you have tolerated the foolish boasting of these false apostles gladly. And what is the outcome of that? He sarcastically calls the Corinthians wise and tolerating these foolish apostles. And then he delineates the list of the outcome of tolerating that. This is, this is what you have received from these deceitful men. For you tolerate, you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you. In other words, that's what happens with these false teachers and false apostles. You see it over and over again. How many times does a David Koresh show up on the, the, the radar in terms of the world and you find that people have uh, sequestered themselves away with somebody like that in a compound? as it were, as, as we saw there in Waco, Texas years ago. A man that says that he was Christ, that he is the, the, the Christ. And clarifying that, and what do people do? They, they're selling their houses, they're quitting their jobs, and they go and live with this man. They have enslaved themselves to this man's vain philosophy, false teaching, false ideology. That's what the Corinthians were doing. And then he says, they tolerate those who devour them. And Jesus spoke of that with regards to the Pharisees. And he, he, he delineates a, a, a whole list of woes. And he's, he's saying woe to the Pharisees. And, and the woe doesn't, doesn't mean, oh, I feel so sorry for you, kind of a woe. Woe, woe means judgment is coming. Judgment is upon your head. And one of the things that, that the Pharisees were doing, it says they were devouring widows' houses. In other words, they were taking, when, when you think of that in terms of, of that culture and that time, and we'd see it very similar in terms of our own time, our understanding, if you own a house, as it were, um, that is, you know, a major asset. It's part of your portfolio. And for a person to own a house in that day was, was something, you know, pretty profound. And that a widow who had a house that these uh, false Pharisee teaching uh, Pharisees would, would uh, and bring them along and hook them along to the point where uh, they would devour their house, take their house, take those... Um, uh, earnings or gains that they had had in their life. And, and we just see it over and over and over again. People, even today, will sell their houses. They will sell their properties. And they will give it to these false teachers, to this ministry. False ministry. Apparently, some of this stuff was happening. I, I don't think that these are could have stuff you know, these are could have things could be happening. I think what Paul is delineating here is what was happening on the ground. That they were enslaved to these guys. That they were being devoured by these guys. That they tolerate those who take advantage of them and they were being taken advantage of. That they tolerate those who exalt themselves. That they're coming and boasting in terms of their credentials. The, that's why he's doing this. That's why he's foolishly boasting because that's all that these people had been doing. 
And again, I, I, I would argue that, that this is one of the ways that we understand who a false teacher is, that they exalt themselves, that they lift up themselves, that, that they are looking not for followers of Christ, the followers after me. Come after me. Look what I have done. Look at how great I am. Look at what I have accomplished. Look how many people I have sent to the mission field. Look at how many people I have trained and encouraged. And it's I, 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 I. There's, there's no, by the grace of God, He has enabled us to do this. We, we can see it clearly. That's, that's what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You, they, they, you will know them. They, their, their ways will become obvious. And so when you see somebody who is exalting themselves, and they're writing books, and they're declaring, that, look at how great I art, <laughs> not thou, how great thou art, God. No, how great I art is how they're representing themselves. And then he goes on to say, and I, you know, again, I, 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 I don't think this is just like, you know, potential, possible list of things that could be going on. But he says they tolerate those who hits them in the face. So apparently this has happened. And so he sarcastically admits his shame and again, sarcastically is his key word here. When he says, to my shame, my shame, I must say that we have been weak by, by comparison because we never hit you in the face. And we didn't devour your house. Matter of fact, he's already made the argument, I didn't take money from you guys. I didn't want your money. The Lord provided in other ways either through tent making or the Macedonian church, he's provided. We've not enslaved you. Matter of fact, uh, to the Roman church, he, he writes there in chapter 6 that they have been freed from their sin. And see, that's, that's what the Judy, Judaizing is all about, you know, in terms of of what we see back from the very beginning of, of the, the church there in Galatians, as Paul's dealing with that, uh, addressing Judaizing. In other words, we must keep this. We must keep the law. We must keep these uh, rituals. We must do this and or plus. We, we need the gospel plus these things. And it was it was clarified at the Jerusalem Council that the, the, the gospel, there is no plus at the end of the gospel. Now, it does not mean that as believers, we will not strive to keep the word of God. But it is because we have been saved by the gospel and indwelt by the Spirit that we will want to keep the word of Christ. The word of God. And so he, he says, in comparison to my shame, that, that's sarcastic. We have been weak in comparison to these things. So whatever these foolish false apostles will boast, boast boldly in, Paul will foolishly boast just as boldly. And that's where we transition to the fact that Paul will boast foolishly in his strengths. You want to go to toe, go toe to toe with the Apostle Paul? He can do it. Are they Hebrews? So am I. And as we think about this, you know, Paul recalled uh, the distinct God given identity and privileges of those who are Israelites. He, he's having to address an issue in, in, with the Roman church um, in Romans chapter 9 you know, with regards to this Judaizing that had been a part of, and again, you, you, you start in, in uh, Romans chapter 1 and continue what, what Paul is addressing 
um, he, he's, he's addressing the reality that every ethnicity, every tribe, tongue, nation, people needs the gospel, including the Jews, the Hebrews. They need the gospel. And they, they say, we don't need the gospel. We have the promises. We have uh, the covenant. We have the word of God that was given to us. We were chosen by God. And Paul recalled this. He recalled the distinctive God-given identity and privileges of those who are Israelites. And he says there in verse 4 of Romans 9, Who are the Israelites? To whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. And so Paul, you know, he, he is saying, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham, of the fathers? So am I. But Paul, he had great sorrow. He had great sorrow and unceasing grief in his heart because many of his Jewish brethren rejected the gospel. They were rejected Jesus Christ outright. And he would say there in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, for I wish I, that I myself were accursed, that is, marked for judgment and death and eternal damnation, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So again, when he starts boasting about his Hebraic pedigree, we, we have to look at what Paul actually believed about his Hebraic pedigree. Yes, these are true facts. But we can't put the hope of salvation in the fact that we were blood-born Jews. Nobody can take their heritage. And we, we see it today. Uh, you know, you, you were maybe raised in a church, and we, we used to talk about this, and there are still churches that still do this, but they have a cradle role. And you were born and became a part of that cradle role. role and from, from that point on, that was your church, and you were part of that church. And I've talked to a lot of people like that in my lifetime that are adults who are not in church. And I, I, I ask them, are you involved in church anywhere? Do you, are you part of, of the church? I said, well, I, my, I, my, I'm, I'm on the cradle roll at such and such church in such and such city and town. Well, it's not even here. They think that because, you know, they had some type of christening or baptism as an infant or, you know, that their name was put on a roll at a church, that they're good with God. And that they, they are, uh, in terms of their family heritage, a part of this church heritage, and they root for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and, and then they just break it down. This, this is my life. This is my family heritage. We've always done it this way. That's not how it works, brothers and sisters. And that's what, what Paul was talking about. Yes, we have this heritage. And that they are resting in that pedigree. But, but Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Well, how, if, you're just, if you're descended of Israel, how can you not be Israel? Because... We have to take the same pathway as Abraham did. The forefather, the patriarch. And what was that? He believed by faith. And it was counted to him as righteousness. And now we, we know what he, what he saw in, in thin, veiled, you know, ability to see how all this was going to unfold. 
that the promises were going to come through the seed of Abraham. And he had all of these promises, and they were passed to Isaac and then to Jacob, who was Israel, and on to the tribes and all, all the way down. And then, you know, the lights become brighter when the light of the world comes. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we see the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And who is that? Jesus Christ. And that the kind of faith that Abraham had in terms of the promises of God would be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so Paul, he proclaimed that it is the children of the promise who become the children of God. And so I just want to clarify that. And, and Paul had once placed his confidence in the flesh as he shares to the Philippian church when he says there in chapter 3, Philippians verse 3, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. He would take his Hebraic credentials and compare them to anybody and nobody. Nobody were as, as pristine as his. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteous, righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But he was not blameless. He, he found that out on the road to Damascus. He found out that as he assumed that he was preserving the Hebraic traditions and honoring God, that on the road to Damascus, he was confronted with the Lord. And the Lord calls out his name. And Paul asks an important question, Lord, who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, I want you to know there are a lot of people in this day that still hold to their Hebraic pedigree. And they're not the only ones. There, there's a plethora of false you know, types of teachings and people out there. I mean, one of the greatest, one of the most advanced and prolific um, family tree in the world is found in Utah. Did you know that? Underground, in vaults underground, you, you have, you know, you, you think of uh, these online, you know, um, family tree type programs that you can connect with and give a little drop of your blood and find out who you're connected with and all this kind of stuff. Hey, they've been doing this for years. The Mormons have been doing this for years. And a lot of people, they, they, they can trace their, their family line. They can go back and, and they, you can even be baptized for dead people as a result of, of that and f tracing that family line to try to, try to usher people in to one of the celestial kingdoms, one of the levels of, of three celestial kingdoms. It's just false. People holding to and that's why he's addressing this. It must have been a part of their argument that he's addressing. But Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, that whatever things were gained to me, that is his Hebraic pedigree and credentials, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And then he says, I count them but rubbish. And in, in the Greek, the, the term is, is actually translatable to dung. And dung is the worst kind of rubbish. <laughs> It's 
excrement. That's, that's what he calls it. That his, his pedigree is just as valuable as that. So that I may gain Christ. And may not be found in him, not having right, a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his re resurrection, and here it is, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So I, I I, I just highlight this from the book of Romans and the, the book of Philippians because, you know, he's got to be swallowing these words, not wanting to, them to go out. Did you ever say something that you wish you could have swallowed it back as soon as you said it? I mean, Paul is just like here in that way. This is hard for him to do. But he's already made the case, and we, we have it before us. He's not advocating for his Hebraic credentials. He's just turning their foolish and vain philosophies and teachings on its head. And then finally, Paul will boast foolishly in his weakness. Kent Hughes rightly clarifies here that Paul boasts in something that they would never boast in. His weaknesses, doubly foolish according to the world, countercultural to the nth degree. He boasts in his seeming disqualification. That's, that's what they had been saying, right? He's disqualified. Just look at him. He's not good to look at. Stop looking at him. He's ugly. He's a terrible communicator. All the things that, that they were saying were disqualifiers for him. And the fact that he suffered so much that, that he had been imprisoned or beaten or those kinds of things, all those, that, that it's like Job. It's like it's his friends looking at Job. It's like, Job, you must have done something terrible. And that's why God is pouring this judgment out upon you. But that's not the case. That's what the world thinks. If, if something bad happens to you, what did you do to God to cause that? And what Paul did was he surrendered to God. And he would become a suffering apostle following the suffering servant. That's why the Jews did not receive Jesus as the Christ because they could not fathom their Messiah being crucified. That's not possible. That's not how this is supposed to go down. But it was how it was supposed to go down. It was there in the Word all along, and I've talked about this, and we don't have time to, to go through it, but go to Isaiah 53 and see one of the most detailed descriptions of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ. Right there, as if Isaiah was there, and he was just taking writing it down as he saw it, but it's how he foresaw it prophetically from God. Hughes goes on to say that he boasts in, in his seeming disqualification, his, dis, his detractors, after he starts out with his fleshly bo boasting in his pedigree, could have expected something more like this. I have established more churches. I have preached the gospel in more lands and more ethnic groups. I have traveled more miles. I have won more converts. I have written more books. I have raised more money. I have dominated more councils. I have walked and talked with God fervently and seen more visions. I have commanded the greatest crowds, and I have done stunning miracles. Take that, detractors. And you know what? Every one of those is true. Every one of those is true. It's true. And that's how these false apostles, these false teachers, that's how they roll. Look at what I have done. He says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I mean, he, he, again, he no sooner, sooner puts that out there. He's like, I'm a madman for saying this. 
but I more so. Paul's apostolic calling, it came with the great promise of suffering. Are they servants there, verse 23? Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so in far more labors and far more imprisonments. Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. That's a true servant of Christ. We have seen it played out like that time and time and time again throughout world history. That if they persecuted me, Jesus said, they're going to persecute you. Because a servant is no greater than his master. Paul was called as the Lord's chosen instrument to bear the Lord's name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. We read that from Acts 9, 15 through 16 earlier today. And we also read that the Lord said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So this, this is how he boasts in his suffering in his weakness. Paul reveals how he suffered, that is, in terms of his weakness as Christ apostle, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in dangers of death. Paul reveals even um, 11, we note here, 11 near death experiences regarding how he suffered as Christ's apostles five times. Five times I received the Jews 39 lashes. Five times. So, you know, name, n number that, 39, you know, five, five times 40 is 200. So take, that's 195 times that he was struck with a cat of nine tails. It's what the Jews did in, in terms of the synagogues. And if he, they went, one of the first places he went to every city was a synagogue. And as a result of that, on three occasions at this time in his ministry, he was, he was flogged, beaten, 195 lashes, and they would leave welts and scars on his body. And the way they beat Jesus with, you know, nails and rock and stone and glass, what shards they, they beat him. He, he is described as, as like hamburger shredded after they were done with him. But this happened to him at this point in his ministry five times already. Three times I was beaten with rods. This was a Roman Greco type of experience. You know, he... He would, when he and Silas were going to be thrown in the Philippian jail there in Philippi, they beat him with rods. Anyway, they, they're still doing that in a lot of countries. Have you seen that? Have you seen people do that with, with people who have been convicted of, of a, some type of crime? And so to publicly shame them, they take rods and they just beat them on their backside. One, once I was stoned. And I've talked about this as one of the most amazing moments in Paul's life that, that he got up from it. They thought he was dead, but then he got up and he didn't walk away saying, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> I'm tired of this. I can't take this anymore. That's not what he did. He went on to the next location and preached the gospel. Three times I was shipwrecked, not including the, the one at the very end of the book, of um, Acts uh, when he was shipwrecked on Malta. A night and day I've spent in the deep. And so Paul, he, he would say to the Galatians at the end of, of chapter 6 and verse 17, from now on let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. And he did. He did. A scarring the brokenness. And as I said, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were beaten with rods and imprisoned in Philippi. 
Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. They wanted to kill him and all the other prisoners because they were taking them on to Rome. And so we just got to get rid of them. But, you know, Paul told the captain, he's like, don't get rid of me. <laughs> if you get rid of me, you're not going to survive. Don't let these men leave. Some of the crew wanted to jump ship. And they end up shipwrecked and they, they make it to shore on the island of Malta. So suffering, not success, was the authentic was was the um, was authenticating Paul's ministry. Suffering, not success. And Paul reveals eight specific ongoing dangers, and they they describe either places or people. I have been on frequent journeys. Number one in danger from rivers. Number two, dangers from robbers. There's a place and there's a people. Danger, number three, from country, my, my countrymen. Those are Jews, my own countrymen. Even the Romans. He was a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen. Number four, dangers from the Gentiles. Danger, dangers in the city. Five, six, dangers in the wilderness. Dangers on the sea. Verse seven, Dangers among false brethren. I mean, he, he is saying every possible place that he could go, among every possible human being on the planet, I face dangers. And then he leaves the best for last. I'm in danger among false brethren. And Paul reveals the ongoing existence of his extreme and great suffering as Christ's apostle when he says, I have been in labor in hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. From the very day of his calling, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul is authenticating this. He's boasting in this. He's not saying like, look what I've suffered. How great I art. No, he is testifying to the greatness of God and fulfilling the very promise of God, the very word of God in his calling. Finally, Paul reveals the greatest suffering. He, he, he saves the, the worst for last, as, as you might say. He's delineating all this. And what is that? Paul reveals finally his pastoral heartache for the churches as Christ's apostle. He says there are daily pressures. Apart from these external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. For instance, Corinth. <laughs> He's writing this letter to Corinth. He, he wrote a strong letter to Corinth and was greatly grieved about how they received it. And he says, who is weak without me being weak? In other words, when you are weak, I am weak with you. I hurt for you. I struggle with you. I hate it. As a pastor myself, there are times I've come along, brothers and sisters in the faith, in terms of their journey, and it's a difficult journey. And I just, I, I pray that God would, would re remove them from that or bring them through that safely to the other side. But it's, it's a tough and arduous journey. It's difficult. Or he says, who is led into sin without my intense concern? Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You got the realities of, of a young man who was a member of the church there who was having relations with his father's wife. And he's calling upon the Corinthian believers, you got to do something about this. This man must be removed. It was, church, it was a call for church discipline. And it's, it's a call that we must make today, even in the life of the church. But we grieve. I've seen people, I've grieved, I've lost sleep over individuals who have walked away from the faith. 
who we, we have walked long journeys with and to see them walk away and we just were crushed by that. To this day, there, there are people that pop up into my mind and I just cringe and I, I begin to pray again for them that, that God would restore them, reconcile them to Himself. Paul saying that this is some of the greatest suffering that he faced as an apostle. And so he says there in conclusion, if I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. And as we get into chapter 12, he starts talking about, you know, this major thorn in the flesh, this weakness that's really gotten a hold of him. And what the Lord reveals to him about that weakness and that, that the, the Lord's strength is perfected in weakness becomes the clarion call of, of his mission, his ministry, his calling as an apostle. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake, but that doesn't mean that, that the Lord was forsaking Paul. And so Paul... He will boast in what pertains to his weakness. And as if he hasn't delineated and and knocked out a few of these for them to know and understand, he he gives a real-life experience here. These other things were real-life experiences, but he gives more detail to this concluding what is something that you you don't want to confess. But he's sharing to his brothers and sisters at Corinth and and for us today. And before he makes the statement, he swears an oath, as it were, affirming the truth of this final example. He's saying, I am not lying. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. And so what does he do? He says, in Damascus, the ethnarch, that is the governor, under Eratos, the king, was guarding the city of the Damasc- Damascenes, the da- Damascenes, in order to seize me. And who are the Damascenes? Uh, they are the, s- the people who live in Damascus. And the whole city was shut down for this one purpose: to arrest Paul, to take him into custody. And it says here that I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. Now, again, you look at that. So what's the point here? Why why does he bring that one up? Well, remember, the first account that we have with the Apostle Paul in his association with Damascus, he was an elite and prominent Pharisee armed with letters and great authority and power, headed to Damascus to thwart the advance and the spread of the way, those people who followed Jesus Christ and propagated his teachings. He was renowned and highly regarded among the leaders of Israel, and yet an encounter with Jesus Christ himself on the road to Damascus changed Paul's life and calling and mission profoundly. And now, in this particular instance, He is sharing in complete contrast to the glory and honor and prestige of his coming to Damascus the first time, this account of being let down like a criminal in a basket. He was. He was a criminal being sought by the governor of Damascus, shutting down the city. Let's get this guy. And due to the scorn and humiliation of his association with Jesus, his Savior, his Lord, his Master. He was a criminal. Jesus said to his disciples, his apostles, you will be hated by all because of my name, Matthew 10, And if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute, also persecute you. John 15, 18 through 20. 
And the Lord shared specifically concerning Paul these words to Ananias. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Acts 9, 9, 15 through 16. So Paul is affirming the authenticity of his calling as a true apostle of Jesus Christ by boasting in his weakness, his suffering, in complete contrast to the boastful false apostles who were lovers of self and lovers of money and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And as we conclude and prepare for just our time around the table, Kent Hughes, he knows that Paul, instead of extolling his achievements, boasted in bearing the cross of Christ, suffering in weakness. And today, we find it all too easy to interpret the gospel in terms of our received culture rather than interpret culture by the gospel. In other words, Oftentimes, people are looking at the culture and saying, well, we got to do this to reach the culture, when in all truth, the gospel is the way we reach the culture. We, we don't change it. We don't change the modus operandi of Scripture to reach people for Christ. We simply share the gospel. And for some, it is a great offense and a stumbling block. But to those who belong to God, it is the power of God. It is, it is the ones who are chosen that receive it. And we need to be wary of our Christianity becoming Christianized versions of our own culture. And as Christians, we need to acknowledge and embrace our weaknesses because when we give our weaknesses to Christ, they become the occasion for strength and glory. And that's what we'll see next week in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul surrenders. He prays the Lord would remove this weakness, but he, he embraces it. And trust in the Lord. This is what Paul argues again and again and again, and he's going to argue again in the most powerful way in 2 Corinthians that we need to give our weaknesses to him as we will see in chapter 12. To quote Paul again, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant not of the better or not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills. That is the law. It just leads. It results in death, the, pe the penalty. But the spirit gives life. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the gift of life that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And <coughs> Lord Jesus, this is. You whom Christ placed his hope and faith in. And he's. He spent the lifetime, the balance of his lifetime in great suffering because of the gospel, that he would suffer for your name's sake. And we thank you, Father God, for this record that authenticates not only his apostleship, but, but the apostleship of, of every um, one of, of those men, God, through Jesus Christ that you set apart in that day, to receive your word and to proclaim the gospel and to document these things that were given to them by the Spirit so that we might read and understand and be strengthened. And so, Lord, as we gather here this morning, we, we have been looking at your scriptures and, and singing uh, this word, and we've been praying through this word, and we've been... Um, preaching through this word, and now, Lord, we're going to see this word on display in terms of your sacrifice, your suffering, Lord Jesus Christ, as we gather around the table that you've set before us. We give you praise that you gave your life, that you shed your blood so that we might have forgiveness of sin and be reconciled and become known as the people of God, a people for his own possession, purchased with your blood, O oh Lord Jesus. We give you praise.
It's in the name of Jesus Christ I do pray, and amen.